Hi, welcome to the Online Jewelry Academy. I'm Professor John R. and I'm your instructor. In this video, I'm going to show you how to make a loop and loop chain. Now, loop and loop chains have been around for millennia. In fact, they date back to the Bronze Age, which is about 5,000 years ago. But my mom tells me that they were making them before then. I've only been making them for about 1,500 years myself, so I can't verify that for you for a fact. But if you visit any museum around the world that has a jewelry collection, you'll probably find ancient examples of this style of chain, and they're expertly crafted. So we know that jewelers knew how to make these for a long, long time. They're pretty simple, and I'll show you how to do it in, to perfection in this video. Now let me show you some of the tools that you're going to need. Of course you're going to need wire. You're going to need lots of wire. To make a necklace like the one I've shown you takes about six yards of wire and I'm using a 14 gauge copper wire. Now in many of these videos I use copper wire because it's an inexpensive material to practice with and it mimics the way that gold behaves quite a bit. So it's a good way to start. You're also going to need for this project a clasp. And here I have just a lobster claw clasp that I bought. You can buy your clasp if you're just starting out, or if you're more ambitious, you can make one too. I also have a variety of pliers here, and you'll see that the round nose pliers, I have stripes painted on them. I have a video on that as well. Now that's so that you can find the same exact curvature again and again and again. Now if you don't have nail polish and multicolors, you can use a permanent marker, whatever you have on hand. I also have a pair of forming pliers. Now if you don't have these pliers, a pair of half round pliers may do the trick as well. I just want these to give me other shapes or curves that I can use to make these loops perfectly formed. Now you're also going to need your soldering supplies. Of course, I've got my torch and some solder. And I'm going to need mandrels. I have three different sizes of mandrels to produce three different sizes of loops. Now the reason for the different sizes is because if you look at the example that I've made here, you can see how it tapers from a smaller loop to a medium-sized loop down to a much larger loop. You don't have to do that if you don't want to, but if you do, it makes for a much more elegant look. Okay, let me clear this and I'll show you step by step how to make your loop and loop chain. Okay, I've set up the bench and now I'm ready to show you how to make the loop and loop chain. Now, in a previous video, I've shown you a soldering setup. Likewise, in another video, I showed you how to make jump rings by coiling wire around a dowel or some other type of mandrel and then cutting them off to make individual jump rings. So if you don't know how to do that or you need a refresher, you might want to pause here and take a look at that video. Okay, let's talk about how to make this chain. First of all, safety first. Put on your eye protection, especially when you're soldering. You never know if something's gonna pop up and maybe hit you in the eye. After that, you're ready to begin. Now this is a little bit of a different type of soldering operation than you've seen before, so pay attention. I'm using a hard solder. You always want to start with hard solder. It's got the highest melting point, and if you need to go back and do any other soldering on a piece, you know you're not going to disturb this particular solder. All right, now I've just wet the brush, and I'm just going to pick up one of the pallions and set it down on top of my charcoal block. Then what I can do is I can pick up one of my rings and I've got the seam of the ring kissing just perfectly. No light shining through it, no burrs, it's nice and clean. And I'm just going to paint the seam. Now I've gotten comments from a number of you guys saying how you always are kind of in amazement that I don't have solder all over the surface of my pieces. Well, I control where the solder goes by controlling where I place the flux and how I heat it. Also, you can minimize the appearance of solder on your pieces through filing and sanding. Okay, I'm going to just set up a few of these so that we can do it over and over again in case you don't get it the first time. All right, so there's another little piece of solder. And let me find the seam on this ring. I've prepared these so carefully that it's difficult to even see where the seams are. 
So you want to take some extra time and really perfect your craft. All right, so I'm just going to place this on top of the pallion. Now, the reason why I'm placing the ring right on top of the pallion is because it enables me to speed up my soldering operation. Now, this is a piece that you're going to be making virtually hundreds of jump rings and you're going to be soldering them shut. So you really want to be able to work quickly. And by setting up your soldering operation this way, you can immediately jump in with heat without having that little pallion just dance away with the evaporation of the water that's in the flux. Okay, once you've got everything set up, you want to evenly heat the pieces with your torch. Now, once you've got an even temperature, the solder should flow, but if it needs a little bit of an extra uh, to get there, just run the flame over the seam. Okay, here we go. Okay, I'm heating the loop with the tip of the flame very evenly by going around and around it on the charcoal block. Want to get a nice even temperature and now when the loop is at a good temperature, I'll help the solder to go into the seam by running the flame over the seam, just like that. Okay, as soon as you're done soldering, you can pick up the loops with your soldering pick. Now this one's a little stuck, there we go. And what you wanna do is immediately quench them in some cool water. What the quenching is doing at this point is it's inhibiting the development of large crystals within the wire. You want small crystals because the smaller the crystals, the more malleable the piece will be. After that, we're just gonna pop them into the pickle pot and we'll let them pickle for a couple of minutes just so they get nice and pink like a piece of bologna. Okay, the links have been in the pickle pot for a little while. Let's open it up and take a look. And there they are, pink as a piece of bologna. If you're soldering copper, you want it to turn this kind of bologna pink. Now, it will depend on how large the piece is, how hot the pickle is, how strong the pickle is, but it shouldn't take more than just a few minutes. Okay, so let's get these out. And I'm putting them into some water to neutralize the acid. And I've already put a little bit of detergent in there so that I could maybe dip my brass brush into it as well so that I could brass brush the surface. And now they look copper again. And if you look carefully, you can see that the solder is really minimized to just the seam. Now, if I want to improve upon that, like I said before, all I have to do is take a file, perhaps a half round needle file, and maybe some 400 grit sandpaper, and I can knock off any excess solder off of the surface and improve the appearance of my piece. And of course, if you're making it out of copper, you could plate it. You could plate it with copper, which would be done with spent pickle, and there's a video on that. And you could also take it to a commercial plater, and we have a video on that as well. Okay, so these rings are perfectly brass brushed right now. They're nice and bright and shiny, and I'll just dry them off with paper towel. And now I'll show you how to do this. It's so easy. By the way, in ancient times, when they were working with gold, they would fuse the links shut. They didn't have solder, so they just fused them. Okay, so here we have three beautiful links. But remember, the necklace was made from links of three different sizes. And I'm just mentioning this again, because if you want to make a tapered chain, you're going to have to have a small, medium, and large dowel to coil on, but be sure to run a test on the, your smallest one first to make sure that it actually works. Because if the gauge of the wire is too thick and the loop is too small, you won't be able to join the loops together. 
Okay, so let's bring back out my pliers. Okay, so I'm going to start with my round nose pliers. And what I like to do is I like to make the solder seam uh, in a, be in a place where I'm not going to really touch it that much. So I'm going to put one end of the jaws over here. The seam's right there. So I'll put one end there, and then I'm going to bring the other one to the other side of the loop. Now I'm pressing down on the tabletop, and I'm going to push the ring down, and I'm just going to stretch it just like that. Okay. And I want to do this with each of the rings. So that's the first step. Okay. So let's go ahead and continue that over here. And again, I'll do it where the seam is off to the side a little bit. I do that because if I need to access the seam, because maybe if I forgot a little bit of solder on the surface, if it's not on a critical curve, it's a lot easier to clean up. You'll see what I'm talking about in just a second. Okay, so we've got these three loops stretched. What I like to do next is I like to perfect the ends of the loops and the shape of the loop. You can see this one's a little bit deformed. All right, so I'm gonna use my forming pliers and I'm just gonna put them into that curve and I'm just gonna like, just bounce them a little bit. Just open and close them on that loop just to make sure that the ends of the curve are identical. Now, if I have a misshapen loop, this is a good time to tug on the loop a little bit and make it a better shape and improve the curve. Now, if they're not 100% perfect, don't worry about it. This is something that you're going to finesse all the way through. So just do the best you can. Okay, so let's see. Here we go. All right, so step one appears to be completed. We have elongated loops with fairly closely matching curvatures to the ends of each loop. Now, the second step is a little bit, not tricky, but different. I'm going to go back to my rosary or round nose pliers and I'm going to look to find the center of the loop. Now, I'll place these pliers outside of the loop, like that, and then I'm going to squeeze together. And what you're trying to do is create sort of a, uh, a figure eight. So let's do that with the other two loops. Remember, come outside the loop, go from the center, and give even pressure to squeeze them together. Now this, that's not too hard. So there, they look pretty good. All right, so I used the forming plier to make the corrections to the ends of these loops. Now, remember, I did the solder off center. You can kind of see it so that if I needed to, at this point, I could still take it off a little bit more from the surface if I needed to. Okay. What I want to do now is step number three. I'm going to pick up a loop and how you hold the pliers is up to you. I want to form around the larger end of the, the plier or over the larger jaw. So I basically want to put it the center of this figure eight into the jaw and then I'm going to push both sides up like so and I'm going to create that shape. So let's do it for the other two. Remember, I want the bigger jaw shape, go right to the center, and I'll push up. We'll do one more. There we go. So we have three identically sized loops that are shut and that have been bent into the same curvature. The rest is really easy. What you're going to do is you're going to take one loop and notice it's little connection here. These two ends are not quite closed and I'm going to use that to pass them over the wire of the second loop and pull it down and then I can pinch their end shut. And now these two are joined. So for those of you who need it one more time, Notice the ends of the, of the loop are open and I'll pass that across the other loop and then bring it down and I can, if I need to, I can pick up a pair of pliers 
and make an adjustment like so, and I can even come into the last one and adjust it. You can, as long as the material's malleable, meaning that you're working with annealed material, it's easy to bend and shape and form it perfectly to make a beautiful necklace. Good luck with your projects. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you'd like to see more videos like this one, you can check us out at onlinejewelryacademy.com and see our entire playlist. And you can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thanks for watching.